All right, let's see how our sound is today. Do we have everything set up correctly? Survey says. Turn on the headphones. Actually be able to hear stuff. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Chris. All right. Excited for another game of another game of day design. Another day of game design. <sighs> Joining you today from Seattle on this cloudy, rainy day. It's nice. We actually need some rain. Phil and I went hiking on Sunday. Uh, it was very nice, but it's definitely a little on the dry side, so it's good to have a little bit of weather here. Chris knows. Everyone always talks about how rainy Seattle is, but it's really only during the winter. You can actually get a bit of a drought once we get into spring and summer. All right. Game design! What are we going to make today? Welcome! Put up my welcome message. We got our blank piece of paper. We got our blank screen over here. The world is our oyster. <laughs> uh oh, yeah. Hey, Senior Bao, thanks for joining us today. Chris says, 80 degrees in May is not what I signed up for, but it's, it's happy, right? <laughs> it's a happy thing. It's been a really bizarre May so far. Uh, we've had half and half. It's like a high of 60 and a low of 42 degrees and then 80 the other day. So weather's been a bit frenetic uh, lately, which makes me wonder if we should start our concept with weather, but I think we did that last week. It was either that or seasons. Okay, it was seasons. Have we started with weather before? I'm not sure. That could be a good concept to start our mind mapping with today. Um, yeah. Weather, sunshine, rain, <laughs> clouds. Cloudy. I've been working on my merge game. I don't know if I've talked too much about it before, but I'm working on this concept where <laughs> this is kind of half inspired by auto chess. I, I've definitely talked about this before. Half inspired by auto chess and half inspired by merge dragons, which you definitely shouldn't check out on mobile because it's very addictive. Um, so this concept of having multiple things, multiple cards, what have you, and those things automatically being consolidated into a better thing uh, when you have a certain number of them. So in Merge Dragons, you have three, it merges into one thing. If you have five, it actually merges into two things. So you can get a little bit of optimization there. Um, one of the recent games that I've been playing that reminded me of this concept is Tiny Towns. There's a little bit of a merge feel to it where you have the cubes. Once you get the right configuration, it merges into a building. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Anyways, been working a lot on this merge game, uh, and right now it's elements or elemental themed. So I've been playing around with uh, <laughs> the different intersections of elements, like what is fire plus air? You know, it's like smoke. Or what is water plus air? Is clouds or mist? Uh, so it's definitely something that I've had on my mind a lot lately. Usually the tentacle clouds don't come around until June. I don't know. I don't know what that means. If that's an actual thing, maybe game biologists. I don't know if you know anything about weather as well, because I don't know about the tentacle clouds. We could do tentacle <laughs> as a concept for a mind map, but I worry that that would get out of hand very quickly. Thunder snow, sun showers. Yeah, thunder snow is pretty cool. 
Uh, I think I might have experienced it once or twice. I haven't been around really lightning or thunder for a while. Back when I used to live in Maryland, we would definitely get it a lot. We had one year where it had like very dramatic storms every day all summer. Uh, that was pretty cool. <laughs> Just riffing on your comment about being a weird May. Yeah, it's a particular we weird May when we have the the tentacle clouds come out. You really you're really not prepared for the tentacles until early summer at least. Umbrellas, puddles, puddle sound. Okay, so it looks like we're just doing weather, which I love. Uh, we're, we're just gonna hop right in here. A little bit of brainstorming, a little bit of mind mapping. And I talk a lot about this stream, about uh, I do it for fun, I do it for practice to get better at riffing on ideas, but the actual techniques that I use it, on the stream are things that I use in my own game design process. So for mind mapping and brainstorming in particular, uh, this merge game was definitely giving me some headaches, uh, mostly theme-wise for, you know, what does it mean when three things combine? What do I want the names for things to be? Which, it's still a very early stage, you don't necessarily want to worry too much about that, but having a little bit of flavor and a little bit of direction to help your early play testers more easily understand the mechanics you're trying to communicate is a good thing. Um, yeah, I have my notebook here. So I can actually demonstrate real world brainstorming. Uh, yeah, here we go. Make sure that that comes out. <laughs> So the key is I want to demonstrate that this is actually techniques that you can use for design. I don't think I have my autofocus on there, so it might be a little bit blurry, but this idea of I um, have, for example, on the water gust, water air side, I have cloud. On the earth water side, I have ice, and those things combine into another thing. So I did a lot of brainstorming to come up with different concepts to see how those would all fit together. So yeah, good techniques, good practice. And today we're gonna make a game about the weather. <laughs> we're feeling very nature connected lately, I feel. Last week it was seasons. We came up with some really cool, exciting concepts around seasons. Uh, things that I definitely want to work on. I just have so many concepts that I'm working on right now that it's a little tricky to fit everything in. Umbrella. I feel like I can write and talk about at the same time about two different things, but it definitely impinges upon my spelling abilities. Thunder snow. Thunder, snow. Uh, I'm I'm just gonna put tentacle clouds in here because I'm interested to see where that's going to evolve to. All right. Speaking about working on different games, recently we've been doing a prototyping, mostly digital component after the original ideation part of the stream. Uh, I like to ruminate on my ideas for a little bit before I dive right into prototyping. I haven't had a chance yet to develop any of the excellent ideas from last week. Uh, the plant migration, the, the planting the seeds, the cards that flip over to designate the different seasons. But I do have another game that I want to get started on prototyping, which uh, is going to be familiar to Chris, so that's going to be fun. Oh, hi, cat. Yeah, you want to be part of the show. <laughs> I like in the stream how I can see your tail just like dancing across there. Michigan has fun weather. Already had a tornado drill this year and got to see a giant meteor last year. Thunder snow is pretty regular most winters. Oh my gosh, that's cool. I don't. Is, is a meteor part of weather? <laughs> you call it a giant meteor? Uh,. There's an Aurora named Steve. 
do auroras have names? I feel like I learned so much just from looking in the chat. This is fascinating. Dew point misery. It's not the heat, it's the humidity. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. That's definitely a nice thing. Uh, having moved out to Seattle from the East Coast, much lower humidity. So even if it does get warm, it's still pretty comfortable. My third games and grub says my first thought was a bumper pool like mechanic with puddle jumping aurora steve coming back to the steve name thing steve's just a good name i was working on a digital game called blade ballet for a couple of years and all of the robots had different names like catbot and <laughs> Razor? Man, I can't believe I forget. I'm like forgetting the, the robot's names. Anyways, Catbot was one of them. They all have very robot-like names, but then the, the one that looks like an 80s printer was named Steve. That's a very good name for a robot or for a weather phenomenon. Phenomenon. <laughs> phenomenon. Yeah, you're knocking over the- I don't know why you're going in the trash right now. Here, how about we- <laughs> You're naughty, so you're gonna be on TV now. Right, I was driving home from work and thought I saw green sheet lightning. Even came with a big boom. Turns out it was a meteor shooting across Illinois and Michigan. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Elevena says, kitty friend. Cats navigating around without getting wet, hiding under things. I don't know, what do you think? Do you like getting wet? You don't like being cuddled? This is punishment. This is how we punish our cats. You see how mad he looks right now. He's, he's very mad. <laughs> you wanna do kisses. Are you kisses? No? No? Okay. Breathe. Puddle jumping. Uh, puddle navigating. Cats. I don't even know what sheet lightning is. I don't know if I've ever seen that before. Animals can be sensitive to weather changes. Cat meteorologist. Okay. You, yeah. <laughs> House panther. I've got one of those. <laughs> I only saw two yellow eyes. Yeah, he's very, he's a shadow. He's very sneaky. He likes to hide in dark corners. It's like just the, the the face of darkness with the reflective eyeballs uh cats <laughs> i like that half the things that i work on here tend to come back to cats in some ways meteorologist it's kind of amazing meteorologist i think that's probably gonna have an extra l in that i'll let it ride half the things most of the brainstorms tend to get cats in them in some way uh, I haven't made a cat game yet, or a game that ha has cats. Um, cats seem to be sensitive to the weather changes in barometric pressure. I would say m animals in general are a little more aware than people because it matters more to them. Like over the last. 10,000 years or whatever, we've been less susceptible to weather, but for an animal out in the wild, they have to be very careful, careful about navigating through the weather situation. <laughs> I'm also completely illogically... Yeah, if I go back through my notebook and see the number of cat pictures, I mean, it might just be because I feel a little more comfortable drawing cats, but there's a lot of them. Anyways, with like a uh, weather hat, um, <laughs> cats with weather hats. One of the things I love about the stream, like this is this is how you make games, right? I am drawing a cat with a weather vane on its head, and by the end of the stream, that's going to become a game. I don't know what it is yet. Whoa, so crazy. Weather hats. 
Weather Vane. Can have another cat with a thermometer on its head. <laughs> thermometer. I don't even know what's happening now. <laughs> Ball lightning. Just as weird as it sounds. Doesn't that, I think that's the one that like travels along either through the sky or like along surfaces. Ooh. <laughs> so we're talking about cat meteorologists, but thinking about this ball lightning and how cats like to chase balls. Um, either just like regular cats or <laughs> I'm going to make this cat all squig squiggly like lightning cats. Lightning cats chasing. ball lightning. That would be pretty cool if you had actual balls that were rolling or maybe just a token that you slid across a board or across the table and then you had your little cats and they would slide across the table. Um, shoot, what's that classic game that we were playing? Um, it has the tokens where you like flick them into the, the center of the table. I forget what it's called at the moment. As soon as I remember it, it's going to be very obvious. You do that with ball lightning tokens. You're trying to make them crash into each other. Um, to make a big, or if they do crash into each other, there's a big explosion. Lightning tokens that slide. So you're trying to either make an explosion or navigate them around each other. And then you have cat tokens that you're trying to knock into the ball lightning tokens. Okay, we're making a dexterity game now. Uh, dexterity. Cat tokens. Somebody in chat's going to come up with this game name and I'm going to feel real dumb. Uh, for the actual classic game that I was playing recently. <laughs> what is the name of that game that I was playing recently? You were there, right? that slide across the table, chasing the ball lightning tokens. Pogs? <laughs> Chris? <laughs> Croconal Chris? Uh, yeah, obviously. Uh, Pogs was... <laughs> hey, wonderful glory. Uh, Pogs was a great suggestion. It's not Pogs, but I like where, where your head's at. Croconal. <laughs> and running from sundogs. Uh, moon cats, uh, storm cats. Are sun dogs an actual thing? Like sun sun chokes? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, storm cats and sun dogs. I like the idea of that. Uh, so this is a. <laughs> Either a 3D crokinole or, um, yeah, or just a multi dimensional, multi tokenol, where you have instead of just the one tokens that you're trying to get into a certain region, you're sliding various tokens across the board, uh, flicking game. I haven't played enough flicking games. I think flip ships might be one, but now there's a few of them, dexterity ones, out there where it's about pieces intersecting and setting things up in a certain way. So that could be a cool direction. <laughs> the channel's trying to get me to make a cat game because I know I want to. I do want to make a cat game. It's just so many games. Like, how do you distinguish yourself making a cat game from all of the uh, <laughs> other stuff that's out there? I also like geriatric weather forecasting. Yeah, as I was saying, that humans are not generally as good at predicting the weather uh, unless you have, um, if you've had an injury or as your bones get older, I feel this as well. You feel it in your bones, right? Which is kind of cool. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, we're, we're making cards now. Triple red, 6-1 with trample and haste. <laughs> is that an uh, actual... Is there a ball lightning or a cat lightning creature? That's cool. That's not one that I know about. Crokinole is great. Yeah. It was super fun. It was the first time I played about a, a couple months ago. It's really fascinating, especially you play these like really big, long, heavy Euro games, and you come to a classic game that's been around for years and years. I don't remember when Crokinole was invented, but it's cool to be able to sit down to something like that and have uh, a very fun experience, the same experience that a lot of people have been having for years, and how different of an experience that can be for a traditional Euro game. <laughs> Why are sun dogs called by that name? Okay, I gotta check out this sun dogs thing. Oh. oh. Okay, so it's like a sun halo thing. I'll have to look more into that. But the so is there a cats thing in uh, weather or meteorology? <laughs> Thanks for subscribing, wonderful glory. Really appreciate it. Glad you're enjoying the show. Okay, we're getting a little punny here, which is great. I, I love, I'm gonna have to write this down. I love puns. Uh, pogs. You know, okay, you know, I feel, so I know, I know pogs, I had pogs, I got like the tube of them, and then I don't know what happened. Like either it was over so fast that I never actually got to play it, but I did have them at one point, and I feel like it was a real, missed opportunity and doing something animal crokinole pogs pogs based could be uh, a great opportunity to play off the nostalgia i feel like pogs are coming back a lot i've seen it mul mentioned on twitter and facebook uh at least twice so that's enough right that's enough for a, a comeback pogs you're on fire today, Senior Bob. Uh, crokinole, traditional, dexterity. I guess Pogs falls into the, the frame of tr traditional dexterity games. We're doing a new twist. Ooh, which reminds me, for any game designers who are in the chat right now, Haba, uh, H-A-B-A, is a family games company. Every year they send out a uh, game packet with some bits from their older games, and they have a game design contest around it. And I always like to, to get the box, uh, even if I don't come up with something that I think is ready to be pitched. I think it's another great tool for inspiration for designs. Uh, excited to get my box. There's a limited number, so you should check it out if you haven't already. But it plays into this idea of family games, dexterity games, accessible games, uh, components, really nice bits, um, and something that's a little more potentially dexterity, uh, fun, fun with a capital F. <laughs> You can get subs now? Congrats. I can, yes, because I am a Twitch affiliate. Uh, as of, I think a couple of weeks ago, I have checked all the boxes of being <laughs> being here on a regular basis. I haven't missed a show except for a couple of days when I was out of town still trying to figure out my traveling stream thing. Oh, Ball Lightning is a card in MTG. Oh, that must be the... The triple red with the trample. Ooh. Oh, yeah, that's super cool. I love it. <laughs> Pokemon took over the Pog market. Oh, is there... Hold the phone. Is there Pokemon Pogs? Is that still a thing? Are they still making that? I gotta... I'm just gonna make a side note about this. Man, I'm gonna have to do some more research on Pogs, because I said, as I mentioned, I had the tube. I remember there was the big heavy one, and then all the cardboard ones, and there was something about flipping. I remember it very distinctly. It was in grade school. It must have been like eighth grade or, or something like that. I think, I don't know if it came with instructions or not. Like, we got it, I mean, we didn't really know how to play, or no one else had the stuff, so... 
I'm mean, gonna have to go to the wiki page, Wikipedia, and remember how that's mine that game for some mechanics that I could potentially use in this uh, sun dogs ball lightning cat game. Still waiting on weather phenomenon related to cats. Weather cats. <laughs> okay, I just googled it. Weather kitty. Uh, if you look up weather kitty, I'll, I'll do it over here so you can see. There is actually an app that predicts the weather. There's a lot of weather cat related stuff, so I'm definitely not the first one to jump on that train. <laughs> yeah, coming back to this idea with the cats having the hats with the different <gasps> different weather telling devices. What if we guys, so we're thinking about the dexterity and flicking, that's one direction. I think it's important to think about multiple games that can fit within each of our brainstorm spheres. One is the flicking dexterity. Another, I'm thinking hats, like the cats are wearing the hats with, <laughs> with the barometric and other weather devices, but it could be a hat that you wear with cat ears, so each person is a weather cat. You are a weather cat. Wear a hat that has a weather vane, a thermometer, etc. So it's like that the, the card game where you put uh, like a playing card up against your forehead. <laughs> or maybe not necessarily a hat. Maybe you wear the cat ears just so you can embody the feeling of being a cat meteorologist. Meteorologist. And then you actually have the cards that are different, <laughs> different weather, uh, weather determining equipment. determining equipment, and then you have to try and, perhaps it's a cooperative game where you're trying to suss out the weather, but you only have limited information. The weather with limited info, uh, cooperative. Yeah, listen to those sirens. For good or ill, my game designs tend to have a long gestation period before they're coherent and playable. I think, I, I know that's true for me. It's been a little weird with my designs lately, in part from doing the stream, and in part from going to a bunch of different uh, conventions and things. I feel like, <laughs> I've been forcing my designs a little bit for better or for worse. So I've been working really hard to get multiple things uh, either to the table or just mostly into a, a prototype phase. Uh, putting things, like getting things from concept to prototyping more quickly, which is part of what the prototyping portion of the stream is all about, and part of just getting prototypes in front of playtesters more quickly. So instead of doing lots and lots of uh, personal tests where I feel out all the edge cases over the course of weeks or months to make sure that it's ready for people, I've been putting stuff in front of my designer friends much earlier. Uh, it's <laughs> It's been a little stressful for sure, putting stuff so fresh in front of people, but I also think there's a lot of positive value to that experience. Uh, there's pros and cons. The earlier you put it in front of people, especially other designers, the earlier you're gonna get feedback. 
and they might suggest ways to push it that you weren't really expecting. And once you try to implement, implement those things, it's, it's definitely going to have an impact on your original concepts of the game. So it will influence, right? It's kind of like, uh, speaking of cats again, Schrodinger's cat, right? Once you open the box, show it to people, once you observe the game being played, it's not going to be the same as it would have been if you let it gestate more. So I think, personally, I like having a little bit of both. So I have some games on the back burner that are gestating, kind of brewing uh, in, on the back of my mind, and other things that I'm actively getting out in front of people. Uh, and, and I feel like, in general, having those different uh, stages and phases of games has been super helpful. <laughs> I, I like this, in your bulb, and then a uh, game biologist here. For good or ill, my game themes tend to get handed to me, and they have to stew a while until I can connect the right emotion to the right mechanics. Right, uh, game biologist, because I think you mentioned that you are doing games for the classroom, so you have some themes that you have to work off of. Uh, it, can, it can be tough uh, if you especially have to do something on a deadline, if you have people who are waiting, and that's the thing with the conventions as well, right? I'm headed to Origins and then Gen Con uh, in not too long from now, and I really want to have new things that I can show to people, so it can definitely get things moving, uh, but it can be helpful too, like this with the starting from the mind mapping and during the stream committing to come up with a game idea can be helpful to get those juices flowing. <laughs> Ooh. Cat says, headbands. Yes, thank you. Senor Bao. You know, this is, I, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who's watching and really appreciate the comments. Uh, when I'm by myself, just talking to myself about my ideas, I'll just have that thing in the back of my mind where it's like, oh my gosh. What was that game? I need to figure that out because it had this really cool mechanic to it and I will just sit there and never know what that is. But here with you, you, you know what I'm talking about better than I do. So thank you. I really appreciate that. Headbands. Yeah. Cats as familiars and weather magic. I, I have to say, as far as themes go, we talked a little bit about this as one of our potential seasons game last week where you have um you're potentially gathering things over the course of seasons and one of the it was either gathering food for your group or for your village we also talked about potentially gathering ritual materials and you need to do your ritual within the season that um was designated for that ritual so it's a little bit of a push your luck if you're not able to complete it within the season then you lose out on that the ritual magic seasonal thing is definitely something that's been on my mind lately. I think that as a game, it can be a very evocative theme and have some really cool mechanics. Uh, Chris knows from personal experience about what this uh, seasonal thing is. One of the games he's working on has that in it and it might be going away. So I might be able to steal that particular thing. Hydra Safi asks if I can code. I can code a little bit. I'm definitely out of practice. I've made some digital games as well using Unity, uh, which helps. Unity has some really good resources. Mostly it's a slow thing for me. Uh, I like paper prototyping just because it's a lot faster to get the game out in front of people. And then some of my games I know will eventually evolve into a digital format. You can still do a paper prototype of a digital game. It's a really great way to get ideas down. <laughs> Schrodinger's weather. Ooh, I like that. Oh, man. Weather. Oh, I just have, okay. That's a super cool idea, like a reverse Schrodinger's box thing. So what if, uh, I'm going to get really cool and meta here. What if we are all, these dots are people? Yeah. <laughs> That's us, okay? 
all of us are here inside the box and the weather uh, this is all us being struck by lightning it's like raining a little bit the weather is happening outside the box so as opposed to you look into the box to figure out what the state is here the weather is happening outside the box but because we're inside we don't know what it is and then by uh, observing it we actually determine the state of the weather I, I like that as a concept. I'm gonna write down Schrodinger's weather here. Sometimes it's all it takes. Oh, can I spell that? Yes, nailed it. Hmm, I think it's got an accent or something. Ah, oh, it had an extra E, ah, oh, so close. Schrodinger's weather. Sometimes, I know Schrodinger's uh, cat is, it's a concept I've read about a couple of times, really, takes a lot to wrap your head around it. Uh, the concept being is like, okay, there's uncertainty principle, right? So uh, the actual experiment is a little, little bit grim, right? There's a cat with a vial of poison. As long as the box is closed, the cat is technically both alive and dead before you've observed the state of it. So it's simultaneously two things at once and then observing it actually, I think in the experiment, if you open the box, um, cat dies. Is where it's at. <laughs> See, it's Schrodinger's, uh, I don't know about like a less, Sch Schrodinger's pie, right? A mouse in a pie, like the pie is either eaten or uneaten, or it's both eaten and uneaten at the same time. I think for like the, the loftier scientific conceptualness of Sch Schrodinger's cat can be like a little highbrow for a game mechanic, but if we take a concept, oh shoot, uh, and there actually is a game called Stringer's Cats that I have that's made by ninth level games, um, which is cool. I haven't got a chance to play it yet, but I was demoing it at Emerald City Comic Con. Uh, but this idea of... I mean, it's kind of like the uncertainty of playing against an opponent, they have a hand of cards, and you don't know what it is, so it could, so it is anything, right, until the state resolves. Schrodinger's Weather. Uh, the act of determining determining the weather by observing it. There's definitely something there. It's a little tricky to wrap my head around it, but Game Biologist says, speaking of Gen Con, got any late afternoon plans for Wednesday of that week? There's plans afoot that may include cheesecake and rugelach. I'm not sure what rugelach is, but I think I would enjoy eating it. Um, yeah, definitely DM me on Twitter is definitely the best way. I, I think I did my flights this year, so I come in on Tuesday instead of Wednesday, so I have that extra day to get acclimated. Uh, definitely want to do some stuff. You just hit me up about that. <laughs> Senior Bob, I tend to be good at chiming in. For reals, it's a nice form of interaction. Thank you. I really appreciate that. The Seasons of the Moons is definitely one of my darlings that I'm deciding to kill or not kill. It's hard. Yeah, I would say... The thing about seasons, which is interesting here, where we're, we're talking about a little bit of Schrodinger thing and uh, determining through observation. So for my idea of the seasons passing at a hard time, or for in Chris's game, uh, which is really cool, Degrees of Darkness, it's all about necromancy, you should check it out sometime, it's definitely one of my favorite prototypes that I've played recently. Uh, so part of that, there's this mechanic to it where the seasons, or the phases of the moon in this case, happen on a regular basis, and it's anything that you are incrementing over the course of the game that you don't interact with directly, it's easy. Even you think about magic, right? Like just remembering triggers in magic. Uh, geez. It's been forever since I've used, so magic has this thing called sagas that they, I think it's recent, it could be old as well, but it definitely was featured in some of the recent sets where every upkeep you're going to put a counter and tick something along. 
uh, anything like that can be tricky to keep up with and maintain. It can be easy to forget it, which is one reason why I really like playing uh, Magic the Gathering Arena, because the computer keeps track of a lot of that stuff for you. Mm. So for this thing, if we're talking about whether the seasons, or whether of the course of the seasons, uh, less just letting something go uh, from like a programmatic phase where you're actually just letting a token move down a track, for example, uh, something where you can actually have influence and it doesn't move until you take a specific action to move it could be a fun way to play around with control of the weather or season. So we're talking about cat meteorologists observing the weather, but it be, could be cool if they were like uh, cats as weather familiars. Uh, controlling the weather. You are a weather magician. It's interesting. I don't know off the top of my head. We were talking about seasons games last week. I don't know off the top of my head how many weather games there are and how many specifically uh, weather manipulation games. So that'd be cool uh, time slash season manipulation games and this could be this might end up merging with our seasons game into one one big old game <laughs> senior Bob says it's just different quantum states oh my gosh I I got through some of uh, A Brief History of Time, and what was the other book that I was- ooh, Who's Afraid of Schrodinger's Cat? I think that's another one that I got part of the way through. It's really fascinating for me, and I wish uh, my brain more naturally wrapped itself around these concepts, because uh, there's just so much cool stuff there, either to make a game off of or just to, to learn from. Game Biologist says, Schrodinger's weather sounds like my daily state of being <laughs> in my cube. Okay, I already love where this conversation is going. In our cube farm where the view of the outside world is very obscured. Okay. Uh, Schrodinger's weather in a cube farm. That's like uh, kind of dark and nihilistic of this traditional office space cube farm with no observation of the outdoor uh, weather and you have no windows until you actually go out the door. <laughs> so what if you're all, uh, everyone is office workers in a cube farm, um, secretly using their weather magic to influence the weather. You don't know whose magic worked until you go outside. Wow, that's like, that's kind of weird and, and deep. You don't know whose magic worked. <laughs> Not unusual this time of year to have coworkers ask what the weather is outside before leaving the building, right? You have no way to actually observe. And, and sometimes in some cases, um, I know here in Seattle, you can definitely have like a very sunny day or like weekly sunny day and then it's super windy so it can be colder than it actually is. Uh, so you, you look up, see that it's 40 degrees outside. It's like, but it looks so nice. Kind of has a Hanabi sounding vibe. Hanabi, yeah. Especially something cooperative. Uh, and Hanabi is definitely an interesting one because you you don't know exactly what the cards are until you put one down. So it's <laughs> the the whole uncertainty. Uncertainty in games, there really is something there. Perhaps not 
rigorously scientific about how the principle was meant to be applied, but there's definitely the emotional state of uncertainty, and uncertainty plays a big part in a lot of games. Barnstorming rainmakers that seed clouds for farmers. I'm not sure what barn barnstorming is, but I like it. I'm just gonna copy this down because that, that sounds really cool. Schrodinger's movie, all endings exist until you observe it. Yeah, I know, right? Alright, cool. <sighs> Seeding the clouds. <laughs> so yeah, there's... Again, every time like we, we do this, especially talking about the, the meteorology and the science behind some of these things, like I know seeding clouds is a thing, right? Uh, I'm not sure of the actual science behind it. I think it's like uh, granules or sand, things that make the water condense so that it actually rains. Uh, and I wonder what other scientific or pseudoscientific, scientific or pseudoscientific ways of influencing the weather. Like if you just took up some like big metal things into the sky and you could make lightning. Um, but then it begs the question, right? We're talking about being weather magicians, potentially having cat familiars, but why? Like what is our motivation for creating these different types of weather? Uh, weather motivations, question mark. So it could be, for example, farmers. Um, yeah, seed clouds for farmers. You mentioned here uh, fighting slash battle. Maybe you need some lightning to come out of the sky. Ooh, that's funny. It makes me think of Thor or something, right? Except the actual science behind that is you have someone up there like rubbing things together to make the lightning that Thor needs to uh, attack things. Uh, so maybe like a wizard, wizard battle. Um, you could be the cat familiars that generate weather magic so that your, so the wizards can battle. Like if you're not there doing the thing, you know, this weather doesn't just come out of nowhere, right? You have the cats actually doing the stuff to make the weather happen for for your humans. Hard working, never appreciated. Hmm. Barnstorming is probably part of the inspiration for Lupin Louie, which I think is that one with the the like him with the plane, right? That flies around. Seeding idea clouds for brainstorming. Ooh, I like that. Um, idea clouds, rain, brainstorm ideas uh, struck by lightning as a metaphor for getting ideas, idea storm idea tornado. So it could all be like a, a metaphorical idea generation. Man, I'm thinking... I'm thinking like a black and white or sepia toned, like the not the new cloudy with a chance of meatballs, but the old school, kind of that or where the wild things are, illustration. I don't know. Yeah, that's, I'm feeling that kind of an inspiration here. <laughs> Magic versus tech weather manipulators. Tech weather manipulation. So it could be two players or maybe 2v2. Uh, or it could be magic, tech, and maybe other things as well, and you're battling against the different ways of 
<laughs> weather manipulation. It's like a weather manipulation contest. See which technique can do it the best. <laughs> Mjolnir is just, I can say that, Mjolnir, right? Mjolnir. <laughs> I think that was one of the saving graces from Thor 2. She's like, oh, it's Mew Mew. <laughs> Mjolnir is just a balloon hammer. He rubs on hair. <laughs> Static electricity. Uh, electro... Magnetism, magnets for generating electricity. All right, so we have a few things going on here. Weather manipulation, control of weather or the seasons, observation as a way of triggering actions to occur. Do, do. I like this concept. Reveal of cards triggers reality. Because kind of from a meta level, you play a card and it becomes real. Like thinking back to magic, um, the cards in my hand, it's nothing, it can go away. It's, they're pieces of paper, really. Or I, I think from the, um, <laughs> the metal level, from the magic lore, I know that I am a planeswalker, and I don't think it's like your spell book, but these are like the things that I know how to do. Uh, but once I, cast this thing, my opponent has an opportunity to react to that, and then it becomes the thing, right? I see myself, you know, I'm not putting down a piece of paper I am generating, so I have a, a zombie bird or like a frog lizard or something, and that creature is in our, my army now, and it's a real thing that fights. Uh, so that's is if I cast this thing it becomes real, but until I cast it, and there's other cards, like a split card, for example, I think is a really cool example of this uh, uncertainty principle where it can be both things, and is both things, until the moment when you take a certain action uh, and then it becomes one thing or the other. Not necessarily pertinent to this potential weather manipulation game, uh, but cool from a meta mechanical level split cards and uncertainty principle idea clouds being similar to word clouds manipulate shapes forms and strike words together to make ideas Ooh. That's a cool concept. <laughs> and that's something like I've done playing around with word fragments in particular for for and then we died, um, which is more just putting the cards down to make the different words. But if you're actually having things, components come together, to create something like the act of striking impact, taking two things and making them into one thing. Generation of lightning. The aha moment. Okay. Split chords, split cards. 
resolution, weather cats. I like the idea of <laughs> the weather cats floating around in these spheres where they're protected because they don't want to get wet, right? They might, the weather cats might be making it rain, but you need to have a very, be in your little floating weather bubble so that you don't get rained on because that would make them sad. All right, do I have my things over here? I think, perfect. So we have some interesting weather game ideas here. Going back to the beginning of the show, we started with this concept of weather in the center of our mind map. Played around a little bit with puddle navigating. Of course, went to cats. Cats are mostly known for not being a fan of puddles and rain and moisture in general. Not every single cat. I know our cat has tried to jump in the shower before and had a very sad experience. So definitely observe this behavior in real life. Talks a little bit about different cool types of weather. Thunder, snow, sheet lightning. And eventually came up with this idea of either directly controlling the weather as a weather magic or controlling it by observation. I think there's definitely some stuff there. I'm not sure exactly what the shape of it will take. I think it's one of those things I definitely want to let sink in and seep in a little bit, uh, especially if it has more effects on what we were talking about last week with these seasons, potentially, <laughs> or it could be a series of games, right? We have the seasons where you're doing your rituals, where you get your ingredients, and it turns out that the rituals you're doing, I'm actually going to write that down. Yeah. Turns out the rituals you're doing in the seasons game are weather rituals that come to play in this next game. I've been playing around with the concepts of games that evolve into each other. Uh, I know the Century games. Century Spice Road, Century Eastern Wonders. Um, I don't remember the name of the next one in the series, but I believe it's coming out either at Origins or Gen Con this year. So they did a really interesting series of games. I haven't seen a lot of things that do that, so it's definitely a cool idea to play around with. <laughs> Big cats don't mind water. Yeah, I know, right? When you see the tigers swimming at the zoo or something, I knew I remembered a cat weather connection. It's Fog by Carl Sandburg. Fog, Carl Sandburg, 1878 to 1967. The fog comes on little cat feet. It sits looking over a harbor and city on silent haunches and then moves on. That's super cool. <laughs> I knew that stuff I learned in high school would come in handy someday. Fog. And fog is a cool concept for this kind of thing as well. Because instead we had talked about being in a cube farm or potentially being just in a box and not able to observe the weather. But what if you are surrounded by fog? And either a magical fog or just a fog hiding you from observing the weather and there's only certain times when the fog is dispersed where you're actually able to observe the weather and that's when the weather happens. So this interesting cyclical phase thing of uh, fog, similar to the fog of war, right? Fog comes in, protects the visions of the weather that's happening, what machinations happen, fog parts and the weather is revealed. <laughs> it could even be 
mechanically speaking, it couldn't even be as simple as like uh, some sort of rock, paper, scissors card reveal game with just a really cool theme to it. So simple mechanics, uh, reveal, or again, diving in mechanically, if you just have your field, uh, just a bunch of face down weather cards that each person is playing, not knowing what the other person is putting down for their weather, and then you have like a cool weather battle thing going on. Cards, your uh, <laughs> weather prediction, I guess, if we're going with the predictions as causation. Prediction. Predictions as causation. Fog parts. Reveals the cards. And you have a, like a weather battle sort of thing going on. That's, that's a cool idea. <laughs> Fog feels a little like magic. It's just full of potential reality waiting to come into being. It's really good at shrouding reality, as Senor Baub mentions. I know... What did we have? It was actually uh, a little sad, because uh, we had both fog and then the smoke from a lot of the wildfires that were happening. I think it was last fall and made this really dense, uh, like fog smog, <laughs> fog smoke, there's a word for that, smog that came across the city and it was really spooky, you know, especially if it's an experience that you don't see a lot, just to have everything. We live in the city, we're usually able to see pretty far, but have all the buildings and things obscured. So just to have things obscured from your vision is a very disorienting experience. So that could be something potentially to play around with as well, is just having, if there would be a way to mechanize that or gamify that, having something right in front of your face that you should be able to see, uh, but you can't. Ooh! Or again, another thing with the double-sided cards or with the reveal, you have something in front of you that appears to be one thing and then flip it over and it might end up being a different thing instead of the, the first thing that you thought it was. Cool. <laughs> As is usual, we've gotten a little bit meta with this game design chat. Sometimes I wonder, like I do, as I mentioned every week, I think it's a very useful tool for coming up with new game ideas. I have a lot of stuff in my backlog where uh, the Truth of Science game is very close to being prototyped. I definitely want to do one of these season games thing. There's some really cool ideas today. Uh, so I think I'm coming up with cool ideas in addition to just having fun, chatting, uh, unlocking potential through spitting these ideas. Uh, but then we just get into these really like high level meta chats. I'm just thinking about life and reality and it's, it's really deep, man. It's so deep. So yeah, with that, we're going to get ready to transition into the prototyping part of the stream. As I mentioned before, I do like to let these ideas sit at least a little bit before I jump right into prototyping. This one in particular, I have some ideas, but I definitely want to let it settle and stew a little bit before I dive right into prototyping the components for it. What I want to do a little bit of prototyping work on today is a game that's not actually something that we discussed in the stream, uh, although Chris will remember the <laughs> the concept because we we were doing a design night and that's when we actually came up with it. Mostly Phil's idea that I'm gonna take and run with because I think it's really funny and I want to work on that now instead of all the other stuff I'm working on. Um, make a copy. All right. 
So the game that I want to try starting a little bit of a prototype for is have you had enough cheese? That was uh, rules. Right. That was another thing that Phil mentioned about a lot of the games that I'm working on. What to eat after the apocalypse. Um, have you had enough cheese? Even a ban on a lot of artichokes. Uh, for some reason, I've been coming up with a lot of ideas more or less recently that are a little bit names, game names, that are a little bit of a mouthful. Um, coming from a marketing background, I know that this isn't necessarily the best way to sell a game, having a really long, obnoxious title. But I figure if you do, people just shorten it. Uh, Betrayal at House on the Hill. I always have to remember if that's the actual name for the game. Everyone just calls it Betrayal, right? Um, so yeah, this idea we came up with a couple days ago called Have You Had Enough Cheese? <laughs> as game biologist mentions, there is no thing as enough cheese Exactly, right? So this is where this game idea, uh, game idea concept comes from. So I like to host parties. I don't do it often enough, really, in part because <laughs> our apartment is small. It's not that small, but the pertinent detail is we don't have a gaming table, like a board game table. We have a breakfast bar and we have a coffee table, which is a good size, but very low. So since getting more and more into the board game scene and having a lot of board game player and designer friends, I, I feel a little bit awkward inviting people over to say like, well, we won't really be able to play games. I mean, we can play a party game with everyone sitting down, but we're not going to have enough space for multiple Euro games going on at the same time, which seems to be the spirit of a lot of events uh, that I've been to recently. All that to say, uh, I do like hosting, haven't been able to do it for a while, but one of my most uh, <laughs> important things when I host a party is feeding people. Uh, and this is a traditional hosting thing, right? You always hear about those people, you go over to the parties, they're asking if you have enough food, they keep feeding you and feeding you until you feel like you're gonna explode. I definitely picked that up from hosts that I've known over the years, and I think that part of hospitality is making sure that people have enough to eat, uh, the right kinds of things to eat, you know, if they have allergies, they have options, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, um, and making sure that people feel at home, right? When you're in your own home, if you're hungry, you can always get go to the fridge and get a snack, so I think that's an important part of hosting a party. So the concept, that's how the concept of this game, Have You Had Enough Cheese, is born. The idea is uh, it's an asymmetrical game, either played over multiple games or played over the course of one game, where one person plays as the host. Uh, they have access to some cheese cards, and there's some communal cheese cards as well, potentially with limited access to the cards. Um, I've been th thinking about the concept a little bit. If you just grab any cheese card, that might make the game a little too easy. But the host, each round, or each time it comes back to the host turn, they're going to ask a person, like, have you had enough cheese? <laughs> I'm, this is one reason I'm so excited about this game. Is like every time I say that, it just makes me laugh. So I think it could, if I can work out the mechanics for it, it could be fun. So of course, uh, well, the person is going to say either, uh, no, I've not had enough cheese, in which case the host is going to give them a cheese card, or they're going to try to get the scoring condition. So they'll have, it's either a set collection, um, you want to have one of each cheese, or potentially different types of like sets of cheese in order to be able to score. Um, and if you, you haven't had enough cheese, the host is gonna take one of the cheese cards and give it to you. And so for the asymmetrical win conditions, there's a little bit of tension there. Uh, one of my cool ideas for prototyping this, which is why I wanted to start looking up 
some cheese pictures. Hopefully we'll find some open source stuff on Wikimedia Commons. If not, ooh, ooh, very nice. I definitely just like take, ooh, okay. Ooh, types of cheese. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh. Whoo. <laughs> I don't know why I'm surprised or if I'm surprised or not, but it turns out there's a lot of open source pictures of cheese. So yeah, that should be plenty of pics for us to be able to use. And it's got all the names of stuff too. Ahu, Ahumaru, um, Beaufort, Bleu de Gex, Blue Stilton, uh, Breeze, different types of Breeze, Cabri, Camembert, uh, ooh, more Camembert. I didn't even know that this many cheeses existed. Farmhouse cheddar. That looks good. Oh man, now I'm just gonna be hungry. Compty. See, I feel like I'm just gonna learn more about cheese through making this game. Oh, Gouda. I love Gouda. Alright. Download. Let's just start downloading cheese pictures, right? Because why not? Uh, so anyways, I was talking about how these cards would be mechanically used. My first concept may or may not work out is you're going to have the different cheese piles and they're all going to be uh, on the backs of the cards. You'll see the different types of cheese. And then on the hidden side of the cards, it will potentially be either just the same cheese, uh, maybe a different cheese. Maybe it's a <laughs> bad cheese card where it doesn't actually count as one of those cheese or like a big chunk card where it counts as multiples of that type of cheese. Uh, so lots of fun stuff that we can play around with with that. Um, so I'm just gonna download these and make sure I get the attribution for them. Uh, Real quick, if you're wondering about the whole attribution thing, for prototypes, if you're not uh, selling the cards, if you're not, you know, really showing them off much except to a couple of people, it's not really an issue to not have the rights to use the image. However, uh, mostly because I do do a lot of showing, posting this stuff on Facebook, uh, potentially sending the prototypes out to people. I like to get open source images and have an attribution for them. It just makes me feel a little bit better about doing credit for stuff. Uh, Gouda. Make sure I write down the cheese names here. Oh my gosh. Camembert. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if y'all like cheese. I'm a big cheese fan. So we're just gonna... <laughs> be oogling these cheeses and enjoying these cheeses and this is super fun camembert camembert i think that's spelled correctly <laughs> how's the brie I, I know i feel a lot of the flavor of this potential future game sell the prototype and test it to see if it will actually become a game I feel like a lot of the fun is going to be embodying the spirit of going to this cheese tasting party. Ooh, that was the other thing too. So the flip side of the cards, um, let me get the Photoshop going here so that we can start to see these cards evolving because it's nice for me to talk about what I think the cards are going to be, um, but it's also nice for you to see in real time, what I'm thinking about. Uh, yes, I usually start off with an artichoke card, an abandon all artichoke card as my template because it has most of the stuff I want in there. Uh, yeah, so I was talking about some of these cards are going to be double-sided, like it's just the cheese and the cheese. Sometimes it's a bad cheese. Uh, potentially some of the back of these cards could be like a grapes or a fig jam or Maybe a wine. I don't know if I want to work wine into this. Maybe some sort of supplement to the cheese game. Um, it could be like a fig jam and have like a mechanic to it. Uh, and then going back and forth between the host and the players of the game. Uh, I like this question, have you had enough cheese? 
I like it if the players are like drawing from the piles. I think it makes a little more sense instead of the host asking every single time just to everyone. Might slow down the game a little bit. See if you can go around once or twice taking some cheeses and then the host will ask this question. I think it be, could be interesting. And a couple of motivations for the host, either um, the players are trying to not explode from eating too much cheese, uh, or they're trying to like eat as much cheese as possible. And the host has a separate scoring condition. <laughs> Game Biologist says, I feel like this is the most important question for this design. Can I play with actual cheese, a la Jen Sandercock style gaming? Uh, I'll have to talk with Jen about that. That could be a really cool partnership. Oh my gosh. I think she does, because uh, I got a play test one of her games at Shucks, which was really fun. And she does some really cool stuff with uh, putting different foods, like hiding flavors in a tart. So if you could do something with like a, a brie and put some fig jam or something in there, potentially. I have to think about it to see how that would work, but I would like that to have an actual cheese component to it. I think that would be really cool. Kim and, oh, Kim and Bear, Kim and Bert is pronounced Camembert. I learned this from Monty Python. And bear, my apologies, make sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Blue cheese equals bad cheese. I, Senior Bob, you gotta be careful there. I know a lot of people who would take offense. I mean, it is bad cheese, it is moldy cheese, right? But if you call it bad cheese, I don't know, some of you might be offended by that. Limburger was always the bad cheese in old cartoons and the little rascals. Yeah, that's a really stinky one, right? Prosciutto ham? Oh my gosh, yeah. I'll tell you, like, this, when, when I host parties, I like to go all out. I get all the cheeses, get some prosciutto, get some, like, spicy pepper sausage, and the olives, and the fig jam, apple slices, and the fruit. Okay, so, let me, back to the prototyping. I would like to, uh, game design. Do I have my folder here yet for this? Where would I have saved it? Have you had enough cheese? Yeah. Um, get my images into the right place. So what do we have over here? We have the Gouda and the Camembert. 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 I'll have to look up that Monty Python uh, skit so I can make sure that I'm pronouncing this correctly. Gouda. <laughs> this is one of the things that I'm trying to make sure I do as I'm prototyping this stuff on stream. Having good uh, processes for keeping all my stuff in the correct place. Because sometimes I just want to do it really fast and I have everything in my downloads folder. I am glad that I'm not showing off my downloads fo folder because it's a little bit of a nightmare right now. But anyways. Game design. Have you had enough cheese? Ah, yeah. Perfect. Oh my gosh, beautiful. Look at that. Oh my gosh, make it really big so it's just like a full. Maybe not too big. Because <laughs> there's the borders there. Sweet. And then we have Gouda on here. Gouda. Ah, oh, perfect. Uh, oh, yes. My folder maintenance. I think the cameras are actually covering up the the folders, the layers here. If you have any questions about my process, I'm not going to say I have a beautiful process, but I I do work to improve my creation of stuff over time. Uh. Yeah, I use Photoshop for these things. I don't even necessarily know if it's the, the best or the fastest, but that is what I do. <laughs> oh my gosh. One of the things I love about using the same template from my early prototype stuff is seeing the old abilities for the cards. I like the pineapple attacks in Abandoned All Artichokes hasn't been there for a long time. So it's like, it's nostalgia. 
Uh, ooh, yes. Interesting. So, Gudabax. I like this double-sided idea, too. It's really interesting. Like most cards, traditional card games, everything's gonna have the same card back. But for this one in particular, you're gonna have, so for all the Gouda cards, you might have 10, 10 or 20, maybe 10 Gouda cards, say for now. And then maybe half of them are uh, just regular Goudas. Goudas. Gouda fronts. So the Gouda backs are all going to be the same. Uh, they're not going to have any text on them. Yeah, so you're just going to have the Gouda card there. It's not going to say anything. And then if you flip it over, uh, you might have one that's just straight up Gouda, right? <laughs> just Gouda. So it's gonna have a picture of a Gouda, and we'll do multiples of those, right? So we're talking about 10 potential Gouda cards, five of them might be just straight up Gouda. So I'm gonna take cards from the Gouda deck, put it into my hand, have the back side of it hidden, uh, and that first one is just a Gouda card. So going back to why we're collecting these cards, we're gonna be eating the cheese, although, Oh, I forgot to mention this. There's potentially a, a swapping element. Uh, I mentioned that it might be the types of cheese that you can grab are limited. You know, maybe one's too far across the table, so you have to trade with someone. So I, <laughs> I was trying to figure, like, if you're eating the cheese, because that'd be weird to trade it with someone's, like, bleh. <laughs> like bird style, right? Chew on it and then, like, spit it onto their plate. It's a little gross. I don't want to go there. Uh, but if you have, maybe you're building your cheese plate, uh, so exactly how this works it might be a little bit weird, but yeah, we're designing a game So we don't want to get too much into the weeds with um, How that might work. So first card is going to be just Gouda We're going to duplicate this and say uh, like I said that's Gouda. <laughs> Gouda. It's a different type of cheese uh, Gouda Camembert Cam Camembert <laughs> fix my spelling on the just Gouda. So this one, first one, front will be, back side of the card is going to be Gouda, but the other side is going to be Gouda Camembert, so let's get the Camembert in here. Oh yeah, look at that. Oh yeah. Oh, it looks so good. Alright, so there's actually no Gouda picture. Uh, let's make our camembert. I just like, <laughs> I love the idea of just these uh, giant pictures of cheese, right? Like you're playing this game and it's just cheese right in your face. I did a little bit of research actually. I was trying to figure out if there what were cheese games like this that are very cheese focused. Uh, I think I saw a couple like Get the Cheese. There don't seem to be a lot of cheese games. Specifically, there don't seem to be enough cheese games. So I think there could be space for this. Art style, maybe like watercolory, but I kind of like these just uh, obnoxiously large, full color cheese pictures. I think that could be super fun. Um, right, so we're gonna come over here. This is not, uh, I think I spelled that correctly. <laughs> so conceptually, and it's like I've been thinking about this for a few days, trying to piece together exactly how it will work. <laughs> conceptually, so you have your host who, and again we don't have the wind condition completely locked down, but it's either they're trying to make sure, uh, they're trying to trip you up basically, right? Like you're stuffing yourself with cheese, they don't think you've had enough cheese, they're trying to give you more and more cheese, but you're trying to eat like the fewest pieces of cheese while having sampled one of each cheese. So uh, I was thinking about potentially having a bluffing element as well. So you have your hand of cheese and they're like, have you had enough cheese? And you're like, oh yeah, I'm completely full. 
Uh, and that might tr trigger the end game or something. And they might call you out for it. And then you reveal, like, I have had one of each cheese. And that's why if the backs of the cheese are different than the fronts, there could be something mechanical there. I learned everything about cheese from Monty Python. Oh, okay. I'm not going to watch this right now, but... Thank you, Game Biologist, for Monty Python Cheese Link. I am definitely going to watch that right after the show. Cause I'm excited about that. Gouda Buddha. <laughs> Gouda Buddha. I imagine most cheese games have mice in them. Yeah, this one... Uh, oh, man. Yes, because there was the one... Gary Gouda. Gary Gouda. I think that's what it's called. I didn't play it, but I remember seeing it in the library at Mox Boarding House at one point. So there's definitely cheese games. A lot of them quite mouse focused for this like hosting cheese party uh -huh. and then again you know you don't have to make a game that's never been made before um but for this concept i think a lot of the humor comes from just the as i mentioned have you had enough cheese I'm excited about that cool so we have um Actually, this is interesting for my <laughs> organization. I could probably just call this a, hmm. So if I'm printing the fronts and the backs, I don't have to worry too much as long as I make notes of how many of each card that I need. And for the printing of it could be a little tricky. So you have to definitely have to make sure the right fronts are lined up with the right backs. But for the prototyping of it, uh, it could definitely be, I just have the camembert and the gouda, because I don't need to make doubles of this. <laughs> yeah, because I have gouda, I can print some. The way that I usually prototype this stuff is I'm going to make a 8.5 by 11 sheet, 9 cards to a sheet, cut them out, and then put it in a clear sleeve for a double-sided uh, fronts and backs like that with something with a thicker piece of cardboard in between them and they're really easy to switch out. And doo -doo -doo -doo. Leave that there for now. Cool. So let's go look at cheese again. <laughs> yeah, it's like, who wants to look at pictures of cheese? These pictures of cheese are really good. Uh, switch my OBS so that you can see the cheese that I'm looking at. Oh, yeah. No, I don't want to look at that. Cheese plates, cubes of Swiss cheese. I like those cubes. The Emmentaler, I definitely don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it looks kind of similar to Swiss. Ooh, what? Oh, my gosh. These are like cheeses that I've never even heard of before. Like this rope cheese. Oh, that looks so cool. Co, co, I have Kobasiki. I would definitely have to check how to pronounce that. Ooh, mozzarella. Oh yeah, that's a good one. More details. Alright, mozzarella. Download that. Mozzarella. I'm going to do one more of these real quick and then probably is that the correct spelling of mozzarella? I just saw it spelled. So, uh, mots, two z's, one r, two l's. Perfect. Yeah, I'm going to make the mozzarella card and then I'll probably be done for the day place our beautiful mozzarella pick after we get it out of downloads. Sometimes I wish I could download things directly into the folders. I probably can. Haha, -ha, there it is. But then the question becomes, is learning how to do it worth the time? That's always the question. <laughs> I love that picture of the way it looks in that picture is uh, definitely like milk soup sort of a thing. <laughs> Mozzarella. 
aka milk soup. <laughs> I think one of the experiential things I'm excited about for this game is just these really beautiful, luscious photographs of the different types of cheese. Uh, if I end up taking the photographs, I'll get to eat all the cheese, which would be nice. Or I might just do stock photos of the cheese. It would be nice to eat the cheese. Um, but yes, yeah, so you have these really luscious, uh, delicious looking pictures of cheese, but you're playing the game, thinking of a, a playtime, maybe like half an hour to 45 minutes, and over time you're staring at these, and then after a certain point, you get to feel that stuffed feeling, even if you're, uh, well, especially if you are eating cheese, like Game Biologist mentioned, eating the cheese while playing the game, but even if you're not, you know, after looking, it's like, oh, that looks so good, and then it's like, oh, this doesn't look too good. And I think it really simulates the experience for uh, for one of these parties, right? Where you're you're eating too much cheese. <laughs> too much. Too much cheese. I can't. I can't have so much cheese. I love cheese. It's so good. Mm. I said one more, but we'll do one one more. We want to get the Swiss cheese. I'm actually not a huge fan of Swiss cheese. I try to be uh, open cheese minded. <laughs> open minded about cheese. And just like try as many different things as I can. But I don't know, for some reason, the Swiss cheese in particular, it just, it's just, it's just feet. I can't, <laughs> it is never not feet. And then it's, it's in the sandwich that you want to eat. And all you can think about as you're eating that sandwich is the, the Swissiness of it. Yeah. Even though it supposedly melts really good, I just like, I can't, I can't Swiss. But it's a very uh, visually known type of cheese. Like the, even though we saw like the em Emmentaler, Emmentaler, I think it was like different. There's different holy types of cheese, but people will recognize the like the Swiss and the Brie. Um, and that's an interesting thing thematically, talking about cheeses or birds or things that are generally known to the population. Do you want to do uh, a more recognizable thing potentially, or something that's um, this just has like cool names and cool words. Do you want people to learn more about cheese as you're playing through the game? Lots of different things to consider. All right, cool. <laughs> the host never wants piles of leftovers after a party. Must get rid of all that cheese. I mean, if I'm hosting, like, <laughs> I'm also eating a lot of cheese. Let's be clear. Uh, which could potentially be mechanical, like maybe the host has their own plate of cheese. If I'm hosting a party, I'm making sure people have cheese, I'm eating a lot of cheese as well. So for, then, for a couple of days after that, I don't necessarily want to be eating cheese. That's why it's important that people eat all those different cheese cheeses that I got. A high class cheese tasting event where eating less is more. Uh, yeah, so the, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, I might make a note of that as well, because the, let me flip on over here to my mechanical notes. I'm just, I'm going to copy, <laughs> be the classy guest who tries to stuff their face with the fancy expensive stuff and avoids filling up on, up with a log of Cracker Barrel Mild Cheddar. Oh my gosh. Okay, I, I don't want to say that uh, I'm a cheese snob. But I want, like, I, I try and get the fancy stuff. I get the weird stuff. I go to the, the Whole Foods or the Trader Joe's or whatever and be like, I can't pronounce that one. Or that one's a weird color. I'm going to get that one. I use uh, my parties as an excuse to get all sorts of different cheeses that I wouldn't necessarily buy for myself. Because they come in big pieces, right? Like, what if I don't like the cheese, but someone else does? Um... Yeah, that could be, but that, that could be a direction for it. Cause I'm still working out 
exactly mechanically, whether it'll be different points, um, whether the game ends once you've got one of each cheese and there's like a trading element to it, uh, or like you mentioned, like getting the fanciest cheeses, or maybe you're drafting win conditions where you're trying to get certain types of cheeses. A lot of potential different directions that it could go into. Game Biologist says, I've got friends who've made cheese at home and I want to try it someday. I've got rennet and could probably attempt a mozzarella. That would be super fun. The closest I've gotten is making yogurt, which is a lot less fraught. <laughs> you basically take yogurt, uh, you don't even need a fancy yogurt culture. You just take like some yogurt that you have from the store, put it in with a bunch of milk. I think you heat up the milk and put it like in the oven, you don't turn the oven on, like it's just warm in there uh, and it just does its yogurt thing. It's actually pretty straightforward. Cheese, cheese seems like it either happens or it doesn't. Like cheese is very magical, right? For it to come together into that solid form. Mozzarella seems uh, probably the best one of those to attempt. Mushroom Swiss burgers have become my favorite. I, yeah, I, I envy anyone who can appreciate Swiss cheese because it's on a lot of things. You know, like the mushroom, I like mushrooms. You know, you have the mushroom Swiss burgers, like, man, if I could just get over my distaste for Swiss, I would be able to consume those things. Uh, yeah, so let me get back over here to our cheese picture so we can close on a picture of cheese. Cool. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a super fun stream. Uh, I'm excited to dig into this cheese game a little bit more. Obviously a lot of stuff that I have to figure out, but one of the things I appreciate being able to prototype this, get some ideas, uh, and it's a great motivator for some of those games to actually get into the computer and start prototyping uh, some of these things. Because sometimes, even as a professional full-time game designer, it can there can be a hump, right? I think a lot of game designers go over this, where you let things, we, we actually talked about it earlier, you let things stew in your brain for a really long time, and it can be hard to just get over that hump, um, just do the first step, right? As you can see here, all I've done is put some pictures of cheese onto cards with some words. It's definitely a lot more work to be done, but taking those baby steps can really um, get over that hump, especially if you're a beginning game designer, as I know some of you are. It can be great to see, like, this is all it takes, right? Like, throw some words on the cards, make some tweaks, uh, put them into a sheet for whatever different, the di different techniques you can use for that, and then you have a game pro prototype. Uh, different people do different things. You can even just write stuff. Uh, I don't necessarily need the cheese pictures for an early stage prototype. It's going to use more ink, right? I could just have them be like, say, the word Swiss. But for this game in particular, I'm interested in seeing how those pictures uh, impact the reaction of the game. So that part of my prototype, I'm going to keep jamming on that. Hopefully have something ready to test later this week, along with the other designs that I'm working on. <laughs> I gotta check in the chat real quick, uh, because we have a Schrodinger's cheese situation here. Senior Baub bringing it back, tying together the loose threads, first half of the stream, second half of the stream, Schrodinger's cheese, milk that's cheese and not cheese at the same time, you're making your cheese in the oven, maybe like you do the yogurt, and it's closed so you don't know if it's cheese or not cheese. It is both cheese and not cheese at the same time. I'm not sure exactly how I feel about that. As always, thank you for joining me. I've been having a lot of fun with these streams. If you have any questions about game design, ever want to hop in the chat, hit me up on Twitter. I'm at Emma Larkins. Always like talking more about design and cheese, and birds, uh, falcon sex hats was something that we talked about, uh, migrating plants, those mushrooms that we talked about last week were super cool. Uh, maybe those like carnivorous mushrooms can work their way into the cheese game. I'll see what I can do. So yeah, have a great rest of your week. 
Might see you again on Friday when I do my casual magic streams. Always welcome to have designers there as well. We just play and have fun and chat about more random stuff. Uh, so yeah, have a great day and I will see you again soon. I will do my song as I start the stream, finishing 